Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks for having me here and push me for the for the introduction. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of the work I did during my grad school uh, not so long ago, uh, only two years ago. And some of the recent work I've been doing at TTI, which is not so much learning, but about uh, discovering the structure of visual categories from annotations, from the data that you can collect from the web, crowdsourcing, and other ways. So why am I interested in this problem? And so one of the main motivations is I want to answer detailed questions like these. So suppose I have a large data set of images of birds and I want to pose a question like, find me birds with red beaks. So how might you solve this problem? A popular way of doing this is to train a classifier for this label. So you take an image and you extract a bunch of features, uh, sift and whatever your favorite is. And then you might learn a classifier based on representations such as histograms of these uh, low-level features. And if you're lucky, this might just work and you get the right answer. So this is a red beak flinch. It has a red beak. So it's great. But often what happens is it doesn't work. And you might get something that looks like that, which is red, but its beak is not red. And one of the issues is the underlying low-level features don't really know what, what does it mean for the beak to be red versus the bird itself to be red versus any low-level representation which is correlated with red. So in other way, the, the representation that is being used, in this case, these low-level bag of words, lack an alignment with these high-level representations, which make it rather difficult for you to parse this high-level question into something that can be decomposed into a way that the model understands. So how might you try to solve this problem? And in particular, uh, I've been looking at sort of two different ways in which you can inject rich richness into the model. So obviously, this since uh, eventually you are interested in these human-centric applications, it's natural for uh, you to ask how can humans, how can uh, we as annotators, as computer vision researchers, help uh, inject richness into these models. So one possibility is that you have more supervision available during learning that can help you build richer models. So supervision can help align these representations during learning, during inference, to solve these problems. And of course, if you have humans involved, there are a, host, a whole lot of other questions that you have to worry about. In particular, what's the best way of collecting supervision? What kind of supervision is uh, the most easiest to use in terms of cost, in terms of accuracy? What are the user interface that are uh, useful in collecting these? Uh, issues and the kind of things that are interesting there are uh, active learning and sort of weekly supervised methods. And of course, uh, you can think of this whole setup as uh, a human in the loop. A human could be a component in this whole procedure where you have learning algorithms, you have humans that can provide labels, and together you want to solve difficult problems that are uh, difficult both for the humans and the computer. So I'm interested in sort of this uh, sort of problems in, in this setting. So I've structured the uh, talk around these two themes. The first one is about rich representations of visual categories. In particular, I'll talk about what we have developed uh, uh, part-based models called postlets, uh, which will sort of motivate why uh, more supervision is useful during learning. Uh, the second one is some of my more recent stuff about thinking about interacting with humans in a, in a more intelligent manner in terms of uh, discovering parts and attributes of object categories from uh, a new kind of annotation framework called relative annotations. OK? So the, one of the things I was interested in uh, uh, 
uh, it's one of the challenging problem in computer vision is detecting people. And people are particularly interesting because they often tend to be the subject of a lot of photographs, and they're also quite challenging. So if you look at these images, which are from the Pascal data set, a uh, common benchmark used for uh, testing detection algorithms, you see that there is a wide variety of poses, viewpoints, uh, there's a dog sticking out of this person, uh, the other, uh, there's a horse uh, which is next to the person and the person is wearing loose fitting clothes that occlude the, the parts and so on. So if you take a, a, a strong pedestrian detector which, is, which works very well for detecting people uh, on the street in, in sort of unoccluded settings and apply it for detecting people like this, it doesn't work very well. So you get something like a 12% uh, average precision for detection. So how might you try to detect these people? Uh, it seems like because there is so much of this compositional structure uh, that you would like your models to be compositional uh, and in particular part-based. So it's not surprising that uh, you would like uh, to use these part-based models to detect these people. Now the main question is, uh, what are these parts that could be useful? So in, in the vision community, there have been sort of two different ways of initializing parts. A popular way is this, this defining parts based on the human anatomy. So humans have a particular skeletal structure, and so it's natural to define parts that correspond to limbs, upper head, and, and so on. And these are what are called as pictorial structures because these sort of pictorially represent the kinematic uh, structure of these objects. And the whole idea is you're going to try to find these uh, parts in images, uh, the hands and limbs, and then st stick them together based on the skeletal structure. The main problem with this approach is these arms and legs are rather difficult to find in images. So in particular, these images, uh, uh, if you try to detect arms, which are just parallel lines, you'll find them everywhere. So it turns out the natural world is full of parallel lines, and if you look around you, there are parallel lines everywhere. So these part detectors are not very reliable. So this procedure doesn't work very well because the parts uh, that define this model are not discriminative enough. So for these parts to be useful, they need to be discriminative, that you should be able to detect them quite reliably from images. And that has been the approach in, in another set of work where uh, one of the leading approaches for uh, object detection is this deformable part-based model from Felsen-Zob. And the idea is you try to find parts that are discriminative, and the whole procedure is a discriminative training procedure, and the model is structured to find parts that can be reliably detected from images. So here's the model of a person on the left and on the right are where these parts belong in images. So this, although this procedure is great, uh, we don't really have the kind of semantic alignment I was talking about in the previous step that you need. So this looks like a face, but without supervision, you don't know that. So if you want to go beyond detection to answer things like what kind of uh, hairstyle the person has, uh, what kind of dress he's wearing, it's hard for the, them to go dig into the model to get these answers if this alignment doesn't exist uh, or you don't really know this uh, exists without supervision. So in particular, we need these parts to be somewhat semantically aligned for you to answer those detailed questions. So it looks like we have a dilemma. On one hand, we need semantic parts, like hands and legs, that can support uh, these higher level questions. But hands and legs don't really work very well for detection, so you need parts that are also discriminative. So how can we get both? So one way of getting that is use more supervision. So the whole idea of poselets, uh, which uh, in a series of uh, papers with Lubomir and Jatendra at Berkeley, we have developed these parts which are simultaneously semantically aligned and are also visually discriminative. So let me just show you some examples of what poselets are. So each row here is an example of a poselet. 
shown as the most uh, the positive training examples are the simil uh, these are the set of patches that each postlet is trained to recognize from background. So just like uh, faces, when you see a frontal face, you know that there's a person at a given location looking towards the camera. These are also patterns that are easy to detect like faces and tell you something about the pose of the person. So for example, on the top is a person with a hand near his forehead and it's a discriminative pattern that can be detected. It's not constrained to be just from one anatomical part, like just the hand, uh, but it represents a, uh, a variety of different poses that, uh, that can be found in images. So in the bottom row is the folded hand configuration. Here, back facing people. Here is a pose that tries to capture the lower part of the body. And if you notice what's common across these images is not that their appearance is very similar, it's the fact that the underlying key, uh, pose or the configuration of these joints are similar. So once you find them, you know a lot about the underlying configuration of these joint positions. So these patches are closed semantically, but if you look at the pixel values, they're not, they're not similar. So how can you find these subsets of patterns that are visually discriminative? Uh, so the basic idea is uh, we're gonna build an engine that can on the fly generate positive examples for any configuration of key points. And then I'm gonna find a subset of these which are visually discriminative. So for example, here's a configuration on the image shown on the left of this particular pose. And on the right, there is another person with the same pose. And that's the window on the right is what we want as the similar window for the left one. So how can you find this patch? And what we do, which, uh, which is somewhat different from existing approaches, is we assume that our training data has extra annotations. So on the training data, we assume that somebody has labeled these landmarks, which correspond to the left shoulder, right shoulder, eyes and nose. And once you have this, uh, solving for this uh, similarity is, is very easy. So you start from an image patch, you forget about the image information and just look at the key points. And then given a new image or a new instance, I can find an alignment, a similarity transform that aligns uh, the source to the destination. And then I can transfer the image patch using the same uh, transformation. And that gives me the most similar patch uh, for another instance. Now, I can do this uh, procedure and also compute the residual error that's left after the alignment procedure, and that tells me something about the quality of the match. So if the error is low, I know that the key points align very well. Uh, so, and I can do this procedure for every instance on my training data. So starting from an image patch like this, I can find closest match to every instance and also compute the residual error. And I keep doing that and gives me a number for each instance. I can sort these instances based on this error and then threshold the list at some point once the error exceeds or take the first k of these. And this on the fly gives me uh, the positive training examples for this pose configuration. Now what you want to do is then go ahead and train a detector for these patches. And that's not something uh, new. You can take your favorite image detection algorithm. What we do is modify the Dalal Intrix detector to uh, detect these patches. The Dalal Intrix detector is essentially a histogram of oriented gradients based image representation and linear SVMs, which is uh, very fast. So we adopt the same procedure. But instead of detecting pedestrians, we tell it to detect these, uh, these patterns. Now, there are exponentially large number of patterns in, in an image because you can arbitrarily define any window. So, uh, and obviously not all of them are going to be very good and discriminative. So what we instead do is uh, we're gonna sample a large number of such seeds. For each seed, I can generate a set of positive examples given the procedure I described. And then I'm gonna select a subset of those which 
are visually discriminative, right? So, uh, I'm, so I put down a random window on all my training examples, and these define the seeds. And some of these are going to land on discriminative patches, like the faces or the poses I described, which have strong contours that let you detect these patterns reliably in images. And of course, some of the others are going to land on textureless regions and others where uh, you won't be able to train a discriminative classifier. So, the, uh, so you sample a large number of these and select a subset using cross-validation. And if you do this procedure uh, for the people category on the Pascal data set, these are the top 100 uh, discriminative patterns that emerge. So what I'm showing you is an, is an array where each batch is visualized as the average image of the positive training examples used by that poselet. So not surprisingly, the most discriminative pattern that's found is the frontal face. And we know that front face detectors are reliable. But then you also get a wide variety of things that correspond to the lower legs of the body, uh, profile faces, uh, more pedestrian-like uh, zoomed out portions of the image, back facing upper bodies, and so on. And what this essentially does is it decomposes the whole person category into a large number of discriminative patterns that are trained to detect a portion of the pose of the person from a given viewpoint. And these are essentially what we call poselets. And uh, we'll show you how you can use them for a variety of different recognition tasks uh, once you have learned a library of these poselets. Sorry, so just now the training set contains some hand-clicked mm -hmm. joint positions for each image right. and nothing else. Nothing else. Yeah, so that lets you on the fly generate uh, positive examples. The alternate could have been I label bounding boxes for parts I think are discriminative. But uh, with poselets, what you get is you get parts that you wouldn't otherwise come up with, such as the ha uh, half your shoulder and half your head. It's a very discriminative pattern that doesn't really correspond to any anatomical part on the whole, but gets selected. So here is an example of um, some of these poselets. Like number 17 is half the shoulder and half the head. When you select a random window, if it doesn't have three uh, joints in it, you throw it away. Yeah. Yeah, we also throw away things that don't match enough um, and things like that. But yeah, so the alignment procedure is very simple. You s randomly put down a window, look at what points are underneath the window, and compute the similarity transform. That's scaling, translation, and rotation, <coughs> in-plane rotation. OK, so one of the advantages of having more supervision is uh, each poselet once detected tells you a lot about the underlying semantics that, uh, that exist. So for example, you can look at the distance, uh, the scatter plot of the key points, the landmarks that uh, are predicted according to that poselet. You can look at the orientation histograms. And then you can use them for a variety of detection uh, tasks, such as detection. So for example, for each poselet, these are the top examples, you can compute the estimated bounding box. the relative offset, and then use that at test time. So at test time, you, we don't have the key points. We're going to rely on the detector that we trained. But these detectors were selected because they perform well. So these are indeed going to be detected reasonably well in images. So for example, if you have an image like these, uh, these poselets might have fired on this person. And what's nice with, nice with these poselets is they're robust to occlusions, because some of these poselets are trained to be detected uh, only on the part of the person. And then you can use these parts to then predict uh, the overall bounding box using a simple Huff transform, and then score the detection based on a uh, weighted combination of the detection scores. And this procedure is actually quite competitive. So in, we participated in the uh, Pascal VOC 2010 challenge, and this was the best performing person detector. Uh, compared to Dalal and Triggs, it's four times better, and it's also 
uh, better than the deformable part based baseline. Of course, it's not uh, fair because you're using more supervision during training, which uh, puts it at a disadvantage compared to others. But uh, one of the nice things for using more supervision is then you can readily use these to do a host of other uh, tasks, such as land, uh, localizing landmarks. You can predict the pose. You can, uh, if your training data had segmentations, you can use them to uh, predict segmentations at test time with relatively low effort, just combining these predictions in a reasonable manner, and you get state-of-the-art results on uh, segmentation accuracy. So this is no longer the state of the art, but when at the time of publication, it was the best performing uh, segmentation algorithm for person category. One of the more fun things we did is um, recognizing attributes of people in the wild. So we wanted to predict, uh, see if we can predict the gender of the person from images like these. And what's interesting is, uh, you can predict the gender uh, even though not the entire person is visible. So on the top row, as you can guess, are the females, and on the bottom are the males. And you can tell that because of the hairstyle, the kind of shoes they're wearing, the pose they are at, and things like that. And if you try to train a classifier on this kind of training data, uh, it doesn't work very well. In fact, uh, it works almost at chance performance. But somehow, uh, if you could factor out the pose and give it training ex examples of these kinds, so on the left are now males, on the right are the females, this is a much more easier problem for a learning algorithm to solve. So in fact, you can plug in standard image features like hog and these histogram features, and it's going to learn a reasonable classifier to separate the left from the right. And uh, this is exactly what poselets give you. So given an image, these poselet detection can factor out the pose from the appearance. And conditioned on that, you can train a discriminative classifier to predict these attributes. So, uh, so more uh, concretely, we had 8,000 instances of people on the Pascal data set labeled with nine different binary attributes. And the task was as follows. So given an image and the rough bounding box, of each person uh, and a given bounding box of the person you're interested in, the goal was to predict the attribute of this person. We needed the bounding box because there are multiple overlapping people in the image and you needed a way to tell which person are you interested in extracting the attributes of. But other than that, there was no information given. And our procedure for extracting attributes is, was very simple. You start with an image, localize the poselets that correspond to this person by looking at the consistency of the bounding boxes. And then condition on the poselets, you can then build a hierarchy of different features that tries to predict the attribute given the image patch for each poselet. So for example, the left one is a front face poselet and its goal is to simply tell whether it's a male or a female given all the front face activations, right? And the kind of features we are using were very simple. Uh, just the histograms of oriented gradients, some color features, some skin color masks, and things like that. And these uh, features were then used to train a classifier, which tries to predict uh, each attribute independently, given each poselet. And then you can combine these attributes to pull information from different parts of the body. Uh, so merge these predictions. And then you can try to use uh, inter-attribute correlations. So for example, if it's a male, he might likely wear long pants or ha hat and so on. Uh, and this architecture looks a lot like a hierarchical neural net, but the difference being that each of these layers are supervised because we have at each level uh, attribute annotations of the instance which makes this rather trivial to train. But uh, it's extremely effective. So for example, here's some uh, analysis on the test set. These are the top scoring wearing a hat uh, uh, images. And, uh, and you can see that the hats are in different locations of the image, but it uh, finds them fairly reliably. These are the top scoring females on our test set. 
these are the instances with long hair. Uh, this is a rather difficult one, wearing glasses, because uh, it's a very few pixels in the image that has that evidence. So you really need to localize that portion using a part-based detector. And what Postlets give you is it, it gives you that flexibility with that latent structure that uh, comes from part detection. Wearing shorts, long sleeves. Here's a mistake um, uh, that is probably because of the hand is occluded by the other part of the body. Was its hand is occluding the rest of the body. Uh, doesn't have long sleeves, short sleeves. Here's a mistake. Um, so we did uh, also a comparison on gender recognition because we, our accuracies were pretty high. Uh, on average, it does uh, really well with 65%, whereas if you just take uh, the chance performance, it's 36%. And if you take the state-of-the-art image classifier, bag of words, multiple kernels, and so on, and then the cropped image of the person, you get an accuracy which is 45.9%. Uh, so that's quite a bit lower, almost uh, near the chance performance because the pose is not factored out. If you give it the cropped faces, so if you have an oracle that can detect the faces perfectly and then you train an image classifier on that, it accuracy actually improves, uh, but still not very good. And uh, we tested our method with respect to a state-of-the-art uh, actually a face recognition system from Cognitech, which uh, one of our colleagues had access to. And um, that gets something in like 75%. And one of the reasons is on the Pascal data set, about 60% of images only have frontal faces, 40% don't, so only one of the eyes is visible. And these kind of gender recognition algorithms don't work uh, at all for non-frontal facing people. So if you had perfect accuracy on the frontal and chance accuracy on the profile, you would still do worse than our uh, algorithm, which gets 82%. And uh, here are some uh, sort of interesting confusions. These are men most confused with women. And not surprisingly, it has learned to pick up the hairstyle. And these men have long hair, so they get mistaken for women women most confused with men, our detector has l learned to put a lot of emphasis on the hats and it classifies these as men. Um, T-shirts most confused uh, with non-T-shirts. Uh, some of them are actually hard to annotate correctly. So our annotators thought this was long versus this, this wasn't, so this is a mistake in our annotation procedure. Uh, short pants is another one where annotators don't really agree sometimes where, where do you define the boundary between long versus short. Uh, maybe you need a more finer grained relative attribute here. And some of the mistakes tend to be because uh, in images like these, it's hard to localize the right part on the right person because there's a lot of uh, interperson occlusions. So here, the, our detector probably thought this was the person being referred to where the actual person the question was for was the person in the middle. And of course, there are mistakes when the local evidence is missing because of external occlusions. Uh, one nice thing you can do with these kind of models is because it's fully supervised and has this layered structure, you can go back to the model and ask, where is the information localized in the image or in the part? So for example, these are the top five poselets that had the most uh, evidence for recognizing gender. Uh, compare this to the poselets that were used for recognizing the length of the hair and glasses. And you can see that for glasses, it's really zoomed in to the, to the, um, at the level of the face. Okay, and then, so this is one of the advantages of having these kind of structured models that are aligned to supervision. It lets you do this 
bottleneck debugging and looking under the layer to see is the model learning what it's learning and is it failing because my parts are not being localized correctly or my features aren't correct and you can test these kind of procedures uh, very easily because these intermediate tasks are well defined. <clears throat> and of course you can have uh, a system that can look at images and generate high level descriptions which is quite neat. Uh, so for example you could look at an image like this and uh, come up with a sentence. It's, it's a woman with the long hair, with long hair, glasses, short sleeves, no hat and long pants. The sentences are not very uh, imaginative because we had a, a templated uh, sentence generation algorithm but one of the nice things it does is it hedges for uncertainty so for example if uh, the evidence is missing it defaults to uh, saying that it's a person because it doesn't know if it's a, a male or a female and it doesn't know much else other than uh, the person is wearing long pants and this kind of descriptions are actually useful for communicating these attributes to describing people to other people. Um, <clears throat> so in summary, uh, this whole Poslet architecture, uh, hopefully I've made a case that uh, using more supervision, you can guide learning and solve this really difficult problem of having parts that are both semantically aligned and discriminative uh, by using more supervision in the form of uh, landmark locations. And having more supervision at training time means that uh, at test time you can predict more things. So you can use poselets as a basis for a lot of high level recognition tasks such as pose estimation, uh, person detection, attribute recognition, action recognition, and get uh, very good baseline algorithms for recognizing their attributes. And one of the things I alluded to is that having more supervision lets you, once you're designing these algorithms, lets you uh, perform bottleneck debugging. So you know if my parts are not being detected correctly, you can evaluate your part detector independently. You can evaluate your features used to recognize these attributes independently, and you can uh, do a much more informed search over parameters and structures uh, with more supervision and essentially guide your learning uh, using supervision. Okay? So if you have any questions about this postlet part, let me uh, know now or because the next bit is a little bit about some of the more recent stuff been doing on human computer interaction stuff. Um. Sorry, when did you show us that poselets are semantically aligned? When? Yeah, you showed me that you can use poselets to solve semantic labeling problems. Right. But I can also use pixels to solve semantic labeling problems. Right, so I mean, the, they are semantically aligned by design because well, the way poselets are constructed are, uh, okay, what does semantic alignment mean in this setting? It means that they are semantically aligned in the space of key points my landmarks. So these parts are designed to uh, detect patterns that correspond to a fixed layout of key points. Exactly, they're locked to the key points, right. which is something to do with you know, position of shoulder, position of waist. Mm -hmm. So they're not uh, sort of ambiguous things that could be detected in images, but uh, sort of rather discriminative configuration of key points. So once you detect them, that tells you a lot about these key points. So that's the level of semantic alignment. Of course, you could have uh, semantic alignment at the label at the level of uh, segmentations or attributes. But here, it's just uh, so for detection, object detection. One of the biggest sources of variance is the viewpoint and pose. Uh, so poselets just try to factor that out explicitly by modeling the conditional uh, dis uh, conditional appearance given the pose and the viewpoint. So each poselet uh, gives you a local uh, appearance model for a fixed set of key points. What's the typical number of key points in a poselet? So in a poselet it varies. So some of them are actually zoomed out full body so they are 
you know, that could be all the key points of the person, which is roughly like 15 or 16, whereas some of them are fairly localized. It could be just a face, it has four or five. Um, Right, so like the face on the uh, has just the eyes, nose, and the ears, whereas something like this um, has a lot more key points. So well, you don't really commit to the zoom or the scale or the location of these poselets, and the search procedure finds these patterns automatically. So maybe the best way to detect a face is to zoom in even further and it's part of your search algorithm, and they get picked accordingly. So, uh, Anshu, how did you deal with occlusions? So, did the annotators, if the thing is occluded, yeah. did the annotator, annotators still sort of uh, mark it? Or no, so they weren't them? marked. So, we our annotation only required them to label the visible ones. And occlusion, so that's a good point. I mean, if they label occlusions, then you could do even better factoring of pose, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't. Uh, I mean, it just makes the annotation tool much more cumbersome if they have to label another binary label. But this, but, this is a question. Uh, if they know where the knee is, that it's behind a motorbike, do you tell them not to label it? Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise it would not be consistent, right? No, what would happen is some of these examples would have half the motorbike visible in it, yeah. and your appearance model will have to deal with this kind of procedure. Maybe it's a good thing, and maybe it's not, and uh, so there are still these kind of choices that a poselet has to uh, figure out. Did you um, use any specific, if like, was, did you formalize this problem of window selection, actually, uh, to, to see which windows should be sampled? No, so these were just IID sampling, IID. but you could be more efficient in this procedure. But like what was the distribution from which you were sampling? So just X, Y scale uniformly at random, IID. and then of course some of these are not gonna land on patches that have no key points that get thrown out immediately. Mm -hmm. So you need at least three if you're gonna solve for rotation and scale, and even more to be robust. Uh, so. I think uh, once there are three key points you can solve for similarity transforms. And then, uh, then it's just a discriminative procedure is gonna select the good ones. Okay, so how many, if somebody if asks you, okay, I have this data set, I, have, I want to detect uh, yeah. something, how many should, do I need? So all our, uh, so in the Pascal, the 20 categories, we, you typically picked 100. But 100 was too many already for things like bottles, where the performance, so if you plot the detection accuracy as a function of poselets, mm -hmm. uh, some categories, so people, performance actually improves all the way to 200 poselets. There's really a lot of variety in appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, but things like bottles or TV monitors, you don't need that many. Mm -hmm. Even bicycles, you don't need that many. You just sort of, you get viewpoints in some parts. Um, one question now. Uh, if in the hub transform, basically the postlets were making independent votes where, uh, and it might be that certain postlets are inconsistent, they cannot happen yeah. it, together, right? For example, the front face and back face cannot happen at the same time. Right. They would still be voting for the same position, and then that hmm. would get accumulated, which is the wrong vote. That is true. So what, uh, what I didn't tell you about is uh, in the ECCV paper, which is about there's an additional step which rescores each poselet based on the context of other poselets. Mm -hmm. So it's not a joint model, the detection model is not a joint model, but it, it's this layered model where you rescore these parts based on other part detections, and then you do the hub voting. And that improves the performance by three, <clears throat> roughly three to four percent on Pascal, so, so uh, it's quite useful. Okay, and then coming to the uh, point of pragmatics, uh, we want this to be working in real time, right? Mm -hmm. And it is a, uh, a computationally expensive sort of yeah. uh, process, right? Because you have all these sort of poselets that you have to be. So we talked about yeah. basically cascaded models for, for those. Not a whole lot, but I mean, uh, there are some yeah. obvious things you can do. Exactly. On, on yeah. the poselets to basically say, I, I can just prune now and basically I don't need to evaluate any other poselet. Right. 
yeah, so we haven't done that, but that's sort of an obvious thing. You can also try to uh, build these kind of convolution architectures that, uh, so these parts are highly, inter there is a lot of correlation uh, between these parts. And you can think of having a separate basis function that uh, you convolve with your images uh, much smaller. So especially if you have lots of categories, you can have a fixed set of bases and then reconstruct the responses for these sort of like the steerable models Deva and others have been pushing or sparselet ideas from a uh, bunch of other people or just hashing these kind of detection based algorithms. Right, and last clarification. So you told, you mentioned the, the Cognitech uh, sort of uh, attribute predictor. Mm -hmm. In the precision, you said basically it works very well uh, and but on only 60% of the faces yeah. because they, they had uh, front faces. But the precision recall curves actually dropped really, really dramatically. If you go back, uh, oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the red curve, okay. So the red curve is Cognitech and actually the precision even dropped before at like even at point two at point point three right it's yeah i mean it works it doesn't work very well it works reasonably well for frontal faces I think, I think. but it's not perfect uh, and when i say frontal the way i evaluate frontal is both the key uh, eyes are visible mm -hmm. so even within that there is quite a bit of variance mm -hmm. and um, also resolution is an issue so if you don't have a high resolution face you really want to rely on other features in the body. So maybe at that scale, the just default to global features. And with poselets, you get that. So each, uh, each poselet classifier can pick the features for that resolution. So in Pascal, there are a lot of low resolution images. Although we try to get the high resolution equivalence from Flickr, it's still that if you don't have enough pixels on these, these algorithms don't work very well. And then, sorry, I want to. Can we just go back to the picture of the hundred person mm -hmm. please? How many people in that training set? There were eight thousand. And how many images? So there were uh, eight thousand instances. That so the number of images were probably like five or six, uh, six thousand. Yeah. So, I mean, there's an obvious uh, division of this train of this. Of what you're showing us here, right? There are the blurry, kind of large scale images, mm -hmm. and then there's one, five, 57. Mm -hmm. Five and 57 seem to be very small variance clusters. Right. They, you know, they're the same, kind of the same person. To yeah. It. Yeah, so, they, so the, there is a lot of redundancy in this. And so, the, so the selection algorithm I didn't describe is a sort of a greedy procedure that finds the best one, then picks the one that gives you the best increment in, improvement in detection. And in that procedure, you can sort of trade off the diversity and accuracy. And it turns out that a little bit of redundancy is good. So two poselets at slightly different scales um, improve performance because the way your detection works is just going to sample a bunch of locations, this sliding window architecture. And it's not a very dense evaluation, so uh, having shifted copies and slightly redundant copies of very discriminative parts actually help. So actually, actually, Andrew, this is a very good point. In fact, if you see 5, 12, 23, 45, 57, and then 94, Essentially, what the model is doing, the postlets are essentially looking at different occluded parts. So it's maybe handling the occlusion case where it is saying only part of the face is visible, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe it, it's a mechanism for occlusion. Yeah, and, and what's just, missing just, here is... White, uh... white male, short hair, looks like bloke in number one. Head tilted slightly to, you know, why is this one tiny variance cluster is so massively represented? And I don't think, I just don't think you can average all the faces that we saw down to give you face five, you know, to give you the uh, face five as the top left. And you it's not, not all the faces. faces. It's all the faces that have the same key point configuration. And not, not even all the faces, just the top, let's say the top 200 faces. So sort of uh, the next image. Uh, so this is the... 
average. So these are the examples that were used by this postlet. And what I'm showing you is 1, 6, 11, 16. So I'm showing you every fifth match that was found for this key point configuration. And it, all the way to 46, there's a pretty good alignment because the face, it's a very large data set. So if you average all this, it's going to line up very well and you get that blurry image. So yeah, in the no, pre- I don't understand the blurry images. I don't understand the clear ones. Which ones? Uh, 5, 12, 45, 57. One. It looks too clear. Yeah. <laughs> How can that be the average of any, you know, I guess they're just if, tiny clusters. If you I guess do that's very it. good alignment, you always get a very short average. No, we know what the average face looks like. It doesn't look like slightly, uh, like, it doesn't look quite as um, white male as this. <laughs> it's also like Pascal, so, you know, yeah, it could be. What was the data set? Yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, 8,000 faces isn't very large by any standard, so. Um, okay, so it's just a small cluster. Or no. Right, and, uh, and this could be, a, uh, this could be even a smaller number of images. I don't remember how these were generated was a while back, but uh, it, you get a lot of sharp parts for faces at least, because these are all aligned according to the key point, so. Um, yeah, so for example, these don't look very white, but maybe on average they're more white uh, faces. Okay, so anyway, so. So if you go to the Postlet's website, uh, uh, there are a bunch of visualizations like this that you can interact with and look at the average images and what are the contributing images for each average. Um, so let me move on to the next part, which is slightly different, but deals with some of the issues on uh, collecting and interacting with humans. And so uh, one of the issues we had when we started to go beyond people to other categories is how do you come up with what to label? So for people and animals, one obvious way is to look at what are the underlying anatomical joints, the joint structure and then uh, come up with these labels. Uh, so for people, it worked really well because people are familiar with people. But for other categories like horses, when you tell them to label an elbow, uh, it turns out elbows are not where you think they are for horses. So horses' front legs, they're actually standing on their toes. So we get a lot of annotation errors because people think they know where the elbow is without actually looking into the instructions. And then there are things like um, the base of the tail, the wither of the, the, the point of the inflection, which are well-defined anatomically, but it's hard to localize them in images because the, there's a skin the animals have fur, and they are often occluding these parts. So, uh, coming up with these sort of key points are somewhat easy, but uh, labeling them is rather difficult. And then there's a host of categories like uh, boats and architecture and chairs that there isn't a reasonable way of coming up with landmarks that apply to all of these instances. So what are the landmarks of chairs? Uh, I can't even name them. Um, boats or architectural objects uh, and so on. So the question I was interested in uh, asking is, how can you learn semantic part-based models in the style of postlets without actually having to spend a lot of time and effort to define uh, these parts ahead of time? So can we obtain part annotations without naming them first? And the answer turns out to be very simple. You can, you just show them pairs of images and then set up this new task where all they have to do is click on uh, landmarks which they deem are semantically similar. Um, and what's nice about this approach is uh, a lot of the time humans can mark these correspondences without knowing the names of the parts. So the names of the parts are great if you want to communicate, but for the purposes of semantic part discovery, the names are not really important. What's really uh, useful is 
uh, what corresponds to what. And by not having this sort of global naming structure and having things driven in a pairwise manner, you can try to uh, elicit such uh, annotations uh, via crowdsourcing without having to spend the time and effort to collect these, uh, name these parts. But how useful are these annotations? So for example, uh, we uh, collected a bunch of these correspondence annotations for buildings, and these are the kind of things people annotate. So the corners of uh, spires go to corners, windows goes to windows, and there's many to one, one to many structures, which is kind of the attraction of doing this uh, correspondence labeling. And compare this to what you might get by matching local descriptors like SIFT, which tend to be very noisy. Um, so uh, what we did in a, in a previous work is uh, sort of analyze these kind of annotations. And what I'm showing you here is where do people click as this image is shown with another image, and each color is a different annotator. And so there is a remarkable amount of consistency in sort of the locations of landmarks that are clicked. But what is also interesting is where the clicks occur it tells you something about the frequency of that part in a data set. So if the part is more frequent, it will get matched more frequently, and that kind of gives you sort of a very weak frequency measure of uh, the, the part. And then once again, uh, if you have pairs of annotations, you can string them together and propagate correspondences. So for example, if you start from a part like this, uh, you can pr use the, a pair to propagate it to another image and keep doing this. Unlike poselets, you can't really solve for translation and scaling in closed form because these annotations tend to be very sparse. So to learn actual parts from these kind of annotations, you uh, what we did is treat the actual location and scale as a latent variable and use these kind of weak annotations to uh, initialize these models. So you start with something like this, which is given by these pairwise correspondences. You roughly get the structure, but the alignment isn't quite there. You, uh, then you can do this iteratively by trying to learn an appearance model and then refining the alignment in this kind of EM procedure. Uh, that cleans up the annotations quite a bit. So if, starting from this and after a few iterations of the learning algorithm, you learn a good part appearance model and also have refined the alignments with each instance. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll skip over some of the other examples, but here are some of the library of parts that were discovered for uh, a few thousand images from a few thousand images of churches. And you can you uh, get parts that capture things like the upper towers, buildings, sort of discriminative patterns that uh, are frequent and uh, uh, are present in a lot of these images. And these are roughly the equivalent of poselets for people, but uh, we were able to get them purely from this sort of correspondence uh, annotations collected off the web. Of course, we don't know the names of these parts, uh, but you can still use them for detection the same way and uh, it uh, works relatively well compared to DPM models. It outperforms them by quite a large margin. Um, so uh, here, when you use, use them for detection, mm -hmm. what, what is the true ground truth bounding box? Or yeah, so we had the bounding boxes also annotated, but the model here is the same half voting. So you learn the relative displacement and then voting. So that obviously doesn't work very well for things that have three towers or four towers. You need a multi uh, mixture model of some kind, but it's still quite good. I mean, the DPM model has the same problem. It sort of models the structure as a fixed configuration of parts. So, how, so modeling these kind of objects is also interesting, even though if you know the parts. Uh, but uh, uh, like I said, we don't know the names of the parts, but uh, with some visual inspection, you can name these parts. So uh, some of these at least. And what's nice is you can then visualize these parts in images, depending on where they were found, and create these overlays of images with words. And uh, these can be quite informative. So for example, you get 
doors, windows, arches, and upper windows where uh, you can then use that to get fine-grained recognition. So if I want to find images with more than one tower or find towers of a certain color or shape, you can, just like Postgres, you can base uh, your recognition algorithm from the outputs of these part detectors and uh, uh, learn better attribute classifiers. <clears throat> so all this was about parts. Uh, how much time do I have or have almost run over? So I think you, you basically have uh, two minutes. Two so minutes. I would, I would say just give uh, one minute. Okay, uh, good, good. Summary and then we, we can break for people uh, who want to leave can leave and then we can continue for five minutes. Okay, so very quickly, um, so taking this idea about uh, part discovery from pairwise annotations, uh, uh, the other thing that, uh, that you would like to look at is parts tell you what is similar, but attributes uh, tell you what is different. So for example, discriminative attributes within a category let you distinguish one kind of bird from another. So that's sort of the other dimension, so parts is uh, correspondences, differences are attributes. So uh, one of the things we wanted to do is discover attributes from large data sets. Uh, and this, these descriptions or attributes are a proxy for what should we recognize for a given category. So how can you collect these descriptions? A common way is to show an image of an object and ask people to describe this object. But this turns out to be not so interesting because if you show an image like this, somebody might say it's a plane. You might already know that, it's not very interesting. Uh, so instead, what we propose is this new task, which is sort of a game where people are supposed to describe differences between these images in a very simple structured manner. They say a sentence and another sentence separated by a separator. And uh, what's, uh, what's attractive about this is this annotation procedure is designed to get discriminative attributes. And uh, it forces the annotators to describe these objects in more detail. So for example, they, can, they can't say it's a plane anymore. They have to say something about the kind of the plane it is so that it's different. And these kind of descriptions also let you uh, annotate images in a much more reasonable manner. So here are some example annotations on birds. Uh, uh, if you take an image like before and look at what did people say about this image across lots of other images, and then just cluster these sentences, you get some kind of a histogram, which like before is a prediction of how discriminative this attribute is, sort of instant specific attribute. So blue bird, black beak, and long tail are very frequent, and here's the Wikipedia description of that and it contains a lot of these attributes, but is also sort of tailored to be crowdsourced. So it doesn't have things like supercilium, which nobody uses, or bibs, uh, but has things in very generic uh, terms, which might be something you want if your eventual goal is uh, um, the, the people. So, and there's a little bit of analysis which we did which lets you factor out the parts and attributes from this text data, but maybe I'll save that for people who want to stay. Uh, so I, I think, so let's thank Subhanshu uh, again. And, uh, and people who want to leave can leave, and if you have any more questions, Well, thank you, and apologize for the time running over, but uh, I think there are some questions, so it took longer. Yeah, but let me just show you the sort of the fun topic modeling we did, which is, um, so what's also nice about this pairs of sentences, it puts constraints on the words and things that appear. So for example, you know that red and white are adjectives because it appears, uh, it changes. Mm -hmm. Rudder is the noun, but this is something you could get with a part of speech tiger, not very exciting. But the additional constraint you get is red and white are two kinds of the same thing. There is, they have to be the, the same thing about pointy and round have to be two kinds of same thing. I don't know what, but I know that there is a, 
underlying semantic category where these two are sampled from. So you can put all of this together in this uh, generative model of topics and uh, which it sort of puts together something that looks like a translation model between sentences and a topic model that samples pairs. And uh, just, this is the whole generative procedure. But if you run this through on the data set, you get these kind of images. Uh, so on the top are clusters that correspond to parts. And the bottom are clusters of words that correspond to attributes. In this case, clusters of semantically related words. And an edge between the top and the bottom tells you an attribute. So you know that the wheel and cardinality is an attribute that is present or is discriminative. So the most discriminative attribute is a rudder color followed by the number of wheels. And these cl clusters are relatively meaningful. So pointy, round, flat, pointed, sharp, point, square, these are shapes, color, cardinality, kinds of planes, sizes, sort of the rough location, something being closed and open, near, on, off, viewpoint. Um, for birds, you get things like, like, bunch of birds. So there were 200 bird species, but uh, nobody recognizes the actual species. So these are sort of the rough families that come up. Uh, yeah, so you get this uh, bipartite topic structure that you can get from this weekly uh, labeled text. But because there were pairs of sentences and the task was discriminative, it, it is quite effective. So, yeah, so in summary, basically there's more supervision is good, but supervision is hard to get, so you have to be a little bit more careful in designing these UI tasks to get the right data out. Cool, thank you. Thanks for sharing. <laughs>